Okay, we're live. Mm -hmm. Sorry for the delay, everybody, but YouTube is giving me some issues. Mm -hmm. To be quite honest, I'm not even sure if we're live on YouTube because I can't get into the the back office. So let me know if you are watching this from YouTube. I see there are people in the chat. So obviously you can enter the live stream from YouTube, but uh, I can't enter the, the back office. So anyway, let's uh, let's press on. Uh, Alexander Mercuris, how are you doing? I'm very well. Uh, I'm very happy and excited to have Jeff with us discussing Australian things, Arcus and all that. And uh, we have Jeff Rich. Jeff, welcome to the Duran. I have all your information where people can follow your YouTube channel, where people can follow you on Substack. Uh, welcome to, to the Duran. How are you doing? Uh, thank you, Alex and Alexander. It's a real delight to uh, be here because I'm just a humble member of the Duran community. And um, hopefully I can offer a little bit of insight as to what's going on uh, down here in the southern indo-pacific uh, about uh, orcas and how it relates to some of the, the global developments so fantastic fantastic and uh, once again i have all your information in the description box down below and i will add uh, your sub stack and your youtube as a pinned comment as well i will have those links as pinned comment uh hello to everybody that's watching us on rumble odyssey rockfin uh, the Duran.locals.com and hopefully on YouTube. Hello to everybody. And uh, let's get started, Alexander. Let's talk about uh, AUKUS, China, the Asia Pacific, Australia. <clears throat> let's get into it. Well, because it's uh, it, we are now seeing a, a major game of power politics play out in the Pacific region this is becoming increasingly the area which the united states is most concerned about they're up against the other superpower which is china in the pacific they're becoming increasingly worried about the build-up of the chinese fleet i've been hearing comments we've had comments from people from the united states who uh, um, come to our programs um, and who've actually discussed them about how concerns there are in the united states that the Chinese are able to build up their uh, naval fleet much faster at the moment than the United States can because China's shipyards are so much larger, so much greater. China accounts for something like 40% of world shipyard construction, the United States less than 1%. So they've got all of these concerns. And of course, right in the middle of all of that, a traditional ally of Australia and, by the way, of the United Kingdom, sorry, of, 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 of the United States and of the United Kingdom, which is Australia. Australia, we have a particular fondness for in Britain. They still uh, have the same king as we do. I wonder for how much, of how long, but anyway, they do. Uh, um, and of course, some years ago, I remember Boris Johnson, Joe Biden, to the fury of the French, announcing that there'd been this great deal, AUKUS done, with Australia to provide Australia with nuclear submarine technology. The French, as I remember, were furious about it. Lots of sound and fury from Paris. And the Chinese, of course, were not happy as well either. Because until just about five years ago, Australia and China seemed to have a burgeoning relationship. Ch uh, Australia providing all kinds of goods and materials to China, the Chinese valuing, as I remember, their relationship with Australia. And a little bit like the Russians with Germany, the Russians assuming that they had a solid relationship based on economic self-interest with Germany. The Chinese made the same assumptions about Australia and it's turning out otherwise. The question is, given this transformation in the geopolitical situation and its own situation what is australia getting out of this is this working is this new realignment working for australia so we're very lucky to have jeff rich 
member of the Duran community joining us today. He's able to give us insights about all of these questions, telling us where AUKUS is going. There's articles in the British media which suggest that it's not doing particularly well as a program. But anyway, as a but perhaps Jeff, you can fill us in, provide all the you know, fill in all the gaps, tell us what's going on. Absolutely, Alexander. And I think it was like September 2021 that the AUKUS deal was announced and it was kind of announced in sort of two phases, first under the former Prime Minister Scott Morrison. Uh, and if you go back to September 2021, it's like a month or so after the fall of Kabul and there's a lot of angst around the world about the um, robustness of you know, US alliances, US primacy, that sort of thing. And there was a big debate about that in Australia. And it was a huge surprise announcement and it received enormous attention in Australia, you know, a few months before a likely election. Uh, and it was generally seen as kind of a good thing that, you know, Australia was sort of stepping up uh, to the plate so to speak, and, you know, was now a kind of a premier military power having nu nuclear submarines, which is the main uh, aspect of the August deal that Australia would gain access in a number of decades to <laughs> nuclear submarines. Uh, and then uh, I think it was 12, 18 months later, the sort of uh, final deal around AUKUS was announced under a second Prime Minister, uh, Anthony Albanese, from the Labor Party rather than the, the Liberal Party, the sort of, you know, the, I guess, Progressive Party versus the Conservative Party. Mm. And uh, the bill was even greater. <laughs> the commitments were even more, you know, fuzzier. And the sort of lock in, I guess, to the US military system seemed to be even stronger. And after that, a lot of voices started to be uh, come forward to say, well, this is really not, not such a, a great thing. Uh, and one of the most prominent being a former Prime Minister, Paul Keating, uh, who, who really questioned the whole rationale. And um, like today in Australia, there's a significant body of opinion that really views AUKUS as a big, big mistake. In fact, um, I think you can probably see that. Just this is the Australian foreign affairs. It's the sort of Australian equivalent, I guess, to foreign policy or foreign affairs, that sort of thing. Uh, and it has an article by a guy called Hugh White, who's sort of Australia's leading defence strategy analyst and has long been a critic of Australia being too um, uh, too unthinkingly locked into uh, the alliance with America. And he's saying that AUKUS is uh, dead in the water, that it <laughs> it, it is... Uh, a plan to develop nuclear submarines in decades time that will likely never be delivered uh, and in the meantime Australia's sort of uh, kind of naval defense capacity is is sort of uh, deteriorating and needs to be replaced which was the original impetus for the AUKUS mm -hmm. deal that our submarines are outdated and we needed to get new ones but this enormously expensive decision which is sort of i guess damaged relations with china has has is uh has an increasing number of critics who say it's a bad defense strategy it's a bad foreign policy and it's just it's too expensive and it's not really achieving things so i guess the question is why <laughs> Indeed, very, very, very interesting. It, it reminds me, I have to say this a little bit again of Germany. Germany, uh, pressed by the United States to build up its military capacity, uh, being pushed in effect by the US to buy weapons from the United States, because realistically, it can't crank up military production to the same levels, to the levels that would be needed uh, um, in order to fulfill all the demands the Americans are making from it. And at the same time, also pressed to supply weapons to Ukraine 
So mm. that the reality is that Germany's defense position is weakening, even as its relations with Russia are worsening. Mm. And the same, it looks to me, is happening with Australia and China. Now, can you just explain what the, let's, let's get we just take a step back because I know yep. a lot of people are not familiar with this now. Yeah. Um, what AUKUS actually was, because it's, it, it, there was this deal with the French to provide nuclear submarine, not nuclear, sorry, conventional submarines mm -hmm. to Australia. Now, would those submarines have been available fast? Because I think that's the thing that, and what, uh, uh, and and I can also remember Boris Johnson, you know, coming and telling us all about Britain about what a wonderful thing AUKUS was. Nuclear technology in submarines is incredibly different, very different from conventional submarines, very difficult to build. Where are these submarines going to be built? Are they going to be built in Australia, in Britain, in the United States? How is it all going to work? What's the plan? Uh, I think some of them are, the part of the contention of it is some of them are to be, I guess, gifted from the United States to Australia. Some of the nuclear submarines are to be gifted from, uh, um, you know, gifted in a general sense to to Australia. And so that's snag number one, because there's a debate within America as to whether it can actually afford to, you know, let go of a few nuclear submarines. Uh, there's also to be some construction, I think, in Britain. Uh, and then there's that snag number two, because there's increasing doubts as to whether Britain can actually kind of fulfil its um, end of the bargain. Uh, and I think there's meant to be some sort of R and D and you know in defence industry sort of flow on to Australia, but um, unlike I think the uh, French submarine deal, there's unlikely to be construction in Australia, mm. um, and that was in some sense as part of the political attraction within Australia of the French submarine deal because the submarine construction was meant to happen in uh, one of the states in Australia, but there were a whole lot of issues with the with the um, uh, the French submarine deal, which was part of what was driving people to sort of look for a better solution, uh, I guess. Um, so the French submarine deal was by mean, no means perfect, um, but Australia has also been sort of um, wrestling with this question of, how to acquire a proper submarine fleet for like decades it's like it's i, I don't know what the comparison in, a, in in other countries would be but it's like the perennial sort of policy failure so to speak within the defense community as to you know how to hell what you know what's what's this decades uh submarine deal that's going to fall over what, what's it going to be so um, AUKUS is basically, it's got, I think, three components. One is um, the nuclear submarines, and that's the major thing. And I think it's like six to eight sort of nuclear submarines uh, at an enormous price, like $360 billion. Uh, and there's also some uh, cooperation around like hypersonic missile research and AI and that sort of thing, which uh, is a minor part of the deal. And then there's also uh, agreements for uh, basing American nuclear submarines in uh, Australian ports in the sort of Indian Ocean port of uh, Perth. So... Um, uh, which wasn't there in the original deal, but ultimately that that's what what happened. So it's nuclear submarines plus uh, tighter integration, I guess, into the American military command, so to speak, mm. and uh, some other sorts of defense cooperation with you know possible sort of industry flow ons. Uh, and overall, it's also um, it, the, the question about what type of nuclear submarines hinges a lot on, well, what is Australia's defence strategy? Is the point of the nuclear submarines to defend the coast of Australia from attack or is it to plant, uh, you know, kind of American-supported 
nuclear submarines off the coast of uh, Taiwan and China. Because for the latter, you would need nuclear submarines, realistically. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because... because of the additional sort of, you know, power and mileage and that sort of thing. And, and of course, the Pacific is the world's biggest ocean. Yeah. <laughs> and the distances are huge. Yeah. And sending conventional boats from Australia all the way to Taiwan would be an, you know, would, it would not be practical in a, in a military war situation. Mm. Six to eight nuclear submarines is mm. an awful lot of nuclear submarines. I mean, I don't think Britain or France, for example, have that number of nuclear submarines of that nature. I mean, just, yeah. just, 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 just to make that particular. Absolutely, point. and yeah. uh, that's what some of the critics have said. That I mean, this is sort of leapfrogging Australia into. I think people used to take the term like the the top table of global naval yeah. power, uh, and it's. I mean, you know, yeah. <laughs> why? <laughs> now there is now the, coming back to the point that you were making. First, as I, said, I remember Scott Morrison mm -hmm. was very much part of the decision making in all of this. And as you corrected, he was a conservative. Then we had Anthony Albanese. He comes and he takes this whole thing a big step further. So it looks as if there's a bipartisan consensus behind this in Australia. Labour, conservative, yeah. they both support this program. Is this yeah. correct? Uh, very much. And, I mean, really, uh, since the 1990s, there's been a pretty locked-in kind of, uh, well, maybe not really since the Iraq war in the early 2000s, there's been a very sort of locked-in, I guess, bipartisan approach to uh, the American alliance, national security issues, um, most foreign policy issues on the whole uh, within Australia. So it's very much a uh, bipartisan um, uh, issue. And, like, I mean, I, I, I don't... I, I'm not really wanting to comment particularly on sort of domestic Australian politics, but it's mm -hmm. it's uh, there's opposition in parts of the Labor Party to it. Uh, indicated by, for example, Paul Keating, the former Labor Prime Minister's outspoken criticism. Mm. Uh, but there's a very um, strong, I guess, leadership consensus within the defence security establishment in Australia mm. around the uh, uh, American alliance, which, it, it, and in a way, it's sort of one of the drivers of the decision. Um, mm. It's interesting that you talked about the the German example, um, because, uh, I mean, I think there's really sort of two two sort of main drivers to this decision. One is it's like a response to concern about the decline of American primacy. So people around the world are trying to work out, well, how do we uh, respond to things in this sort of changed world? Uh, and the response in Australia um, it has been um it's sort of like well, we've got to steal the spine of america to keep being primacy you know being being number one there's a very strong belief within uh i guess defense foreign policy circles in australia that uh, american primacy has been good for australia and uh, we'd like it to continue and so we want to uh and we can see the um, you know, fading will or the concern about, you know, Trump and nationalism or, or sort of a more isolationist approach in Australia. And mm -hmm. so we want to uh, be the best possible ally we could, uh, step up, make more contribution and, you know, go and get those nuclear submarines. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like a, uh, it, it's all, a, almost like a defensive sort of response to the, um, fall of American primacy. Uh, and then I guess the other driver is just the uh, the the um, sort of what Emmanuel Todd talks about in his recent book, uh, The Defeat of the West, the sort of uh, decaying sort of leadership culture in uh, 
many countries around the world and their sort of um, integration with uh, the sort of, you know, the sort of post-imperial American sort of system. And so uh, that that those two drivers have reinforced a long, long, long tradition in Australian foreign policy of really um, uh, holding on tight to our great and powerful friend. You know, first it was Britain, uh, and then after World War II, it was America. And um, uh, the the sort of trade and economic relationship with China has developed uh, enormously over the last, well, really since the 1970s, but especially since uh, the 1980s. And... Uh, uh, but that's always been done within uh, the umbrella of, uh, um, I guess, believing in American primacy and the importance of uh, Australia um, having that security partnership with America. So whilst America felt was strong and committed to Australia or defensive Australia, the Australians said to themselves, well, we can... We can do our deals with China, but as America retreats, we are becoming more nervous and we cling to the Americans even more. Now, some might find that a rather strange kind of logic, actually. I mean, if the Americans are withdrawing all the fear is that, the, that they are, I mean, it, it might make rather more sense, perhaps, to work out a more stable relationship with the other power. But is it the case, perhaps, that deep down many people in Australia are afraid of China? Uh, that's an interesting question, and I guess there's a couple of different um, uh, interpretations, I guess, of what's going on. One is, you know, Australia had uh, a bit of a tainted history of, uh, like a lot of countries, of having um, race-related immigration policy, so the sort of white Australia policy, which began in like the early 1900s and really continued on until the 1960s. Uh, so there's some level of that. But on the other hand, um, uh, uh, you know, Chinese migration to Australia and Indian migration to Australia is enormous. I mean, they're the second and third largest uh, immigrant groups. Uh, within Australia, and I think like a huge proportion of the Australian population have you know family born overseas. Uh, so, but some people say that's a, a sort of an underlying racism. It might be the case. I don't think that's right. Uh, then the other uh, argument is uh, there's a fear of abandonment. We're geographically isolated, huge coastline. Um, a long way from uh, London and New York, uh, and we've uh, had this famous incident in our history in like 1941, 1942, when uh, the Japanese, uh, you know, empire came and took Singapore, uh, and uh, as part of the general kind of collapse, so to speak, of the British Empire during World War II. Mm. And that's often seen as, um, you know, Britain let us down in our direst need uh, and that was why we switched to America. So there is this argument that there's a fear of abandonment uh, in, I guess, Australian political culture. Uh, and then I guess the third possibility is that... Uh, I mean, the AUKUS, I mean, the Australian public didn't have a whole lot to do with the AUKUS deal. <laughs> it's it's a phenomenon that occurred as a result of, you know, elite decision makers, a very small circle of decision makers. Mm. Uh, people say in Australia the, the culture of foreign policy is very dominated by defence and security issues. Uh, and it's very dominated by, you know, all the network around uh, the American alliance, the Five Eyes, the, uh, you know, the intelligence sharing and all that sort of mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, so it's perhaps, and there's enormous amounts of um, um, kind of relationship building that goes on between 
you know, America and the political elites in in Australia through things like the Australian American Leadership Dialogue and, and other sorts of things. Mm. So I guess the third possibility is that it's more a case of not so much the Australian people being worried about being abandoned as the Australian uh, defence elite being worried about losing uh, mm. their control of all those amazing toys that they currently have. Mm. Uh, and I suspect it's a little bit more that, it's, as well as clouded thinking, really. And this is mm. what um, Hugh White says uh, in his utterly, utterly, utterly scathing um, uh, about the decision uh, and says it's 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 perhaps our greatest ever defence policy failure, and perhaps the greatest defence policy failure anywhere in the world. <laughs> so he's sort of not well, not, no, no holds barred there. <laughs> I, I think he should speak to General Kuyat, who's the Inspector General of the German Army, because he's oh, been saying many yes. of the, many of the same things in Germany as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'd like to turn to actually public opinion in Australia, because mm -hmm. um, you know Australia has had radical political movements and peace peace mm -hmm. movements mm -hmm. in the past. Uh, there's some very radical Australian journalists that I've known at various mm. times. Uh, uh, John Pilger, for example, who died mm -hmm. recently. I, I knew him uh, uh, slightly. So what is Australian public opinion? How are they talking about? I mean, is this a big issue in, in Australia? And once upon a time, war and peace issues were very big issues, certainly in Europe. And people came out and protested about them. And they worried about them and they were worried about war situations. You don't see that very much in Europe anymore. Maybe there's the first stirrings of it. But as you rightly mm. said, it's still very much within an elite consensus, at least in Europe. What about Australia? Are people concerned? Are they saying, you know, we're getting these enormous weapons in 30, 40, 50 years time, at huge cost. And in the meantime, we are making serious mistakes in our long-term relationships, both with China and also in our strategies on defence questions. Are people talking about this at all? I mean, is this an issue? Are the protests, is the opposition in Australia to this from a, at a popular level? Uh, look, absolutely, people are talking about it. I don't think there's really um, broad protests at a popular level there's a lot of iffiness like um you know the 365 or whatever it is billion dollars has occurred at the same time as a few other economic problems in australia yeah. you know uh, government priority type questions um but there is very significant, like people like Hugh White, leading voice. There's a guy called Sam Rogovine from the Lowy Institute, which is otherwise a very kind of centrist, mm. pro-American kind of uh, institute. And he's by no means anti-American, but he absolutely is scathing about AUKUS and, mm. and um, proposes a whole different kind of defence strategy. And then there's like uh, there's a, a publication called Pearls and Irritations that's published by a former kind of head of the Prime Minister's Department in Australia, John Menadieu, which has carried many, many uh, articles and there's a whole lot of critics there. But I don't really see it breaking through as a, a broad-scale mm. protest issue. I mean, the 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 situation in Gaza, there's been like um, uh, kind of weekly protest marches now in in uh, various Melbourne, Australian cities over the last few months around that. So it, it has cut through uh, in a way that hasn't perhaps with AUKUS. And I mean, mm -hmm. for, I guess, totally understandable emotional reasons, it's a terrible <laughs> situation, isn't mm -hmm. it? I, I, I have to say, there's, there's some sense of deja vu for me in some of this, mm -hmm. because um, I, 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 my, my memory, as I've said many times, does stretch back to the 1960s. 
And mm. I remember that in the 1960s, Australia mm. seemed to be on something like the same trajectory as it is today. It mm. sent troops to fight in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. It was becoming very strong with the United States. It bought F-111 fighter jets from the United States, about the only country in the end that did, as I sort of remember, which were in, the, in, yeah. in their day. I mean, they were, you know, they were the most complex, expensive fighter jets that you could yeah. possibly own. And, I seem to uh, recall they were flops, but that were, I was very young at the time. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, I mean, you know, but in the end, it did trigger a kind of backlash and a sort of radicalization mm. so you got you got briefly the Gough Whitlam government which I'm sure we both mm. remember mm -hmm. uh, you got a sort of swing away from some of this and maybe an opening up of debate in Australia mm. uh, um, for a certain period of time uh, could we see something like that again? I mean, we're, we're back to, you know, the Anglo-American alliance, the friendship with the United States, buying yeah. expensive weapons from them, getting involved in American quarrels with other countries. <laughs> Will there be a backlash one day, do you think? Uh, look, I think it's partly driven by uh, situations that leaders find themselves in a little bit. Um, I mean, there's this uh, terrific book here, which is by a guy called James Curran. It's Australia's China Odyssey from Euphoria to Fear. Uh, and he really traces the whole um, the history of Australia's foreign policy relationship with China all the way back to, like, you know, World War II sort of thing. Uh, and it's a lot more complicated than it's often presented. Um, but broadly, uh, you know, um, Australia switched to the United States at World War II. It took a little bit, you know, a decade maybe to really fully embrace the American alliance versus the British Empire. Uh, and then in the 1970s, I guess there's this period, uh, which is when the Whitlam government um, is in power for three years or so, um, there is this period where I guess partly in response to America's problems. I mean, we've got the, the you know the 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 um, float you know removal from the gold standard. We've got the loss in Vietnam War. We've got the political crisis. We've got the you know economic problems, and we've got the I mean I guess cultural challenges maybe um, within America. Uh, and Britain is now utterly irrelevant, is by the 1970s pretty much irrelevant. Uh, and so there is this strong surge to a more uh, independent foreign policy uh, for Australia. And that's partly there's a significant development of the relationship with China and Vietnam and others through the 1970s. And then in the 1980s, it's... Um, Again, Australia is pursuing a much more pro-America alliance, but it has an extraordinarily good relationship with China under the Prime Minister Bob Hawke. Um, uh, he, he, he was reputed to have the best access to the Chinese leadership uh, anywhere in the world uh, and was relied upon uh, very much by the Americans for... Uh, for that, and he also, uh, I guess, repositioned Australia economically to be more of an open trading country, and to, to, to you know, have the economic complementarity between China and ourselves. And uh, but then, you know, there's the end of the Cold War, uh, and for a while, Paul Keating does pursue a more independent uh, foreign policy. Um, but uh, and like he he becomes prime minister literally like as the Soviet Union collapses in you know at the end of 1991, he pursues a more uh, independent nationalist sort of foreign policy, but again broadly within the American umbrella. So it's no surprise that he's he's the only prime minister since the 1990s who has come out so strongly against. AUKUS, because he was really the last one who, I guess, had a perhaps a broader vision of where Australia could be in the world. 
uh, including relationships with Indonesia and all that sort of thing. And then under John Howard, through to nineties and early two thousands, he 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 kind of cements the relationship. He sort of does a similar thing to I guess what we're doing with AUKUS. You know the the Twin Towers happens. John Howard's in New York at the time, and he 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 sort of feels the pain of the American leadership and says, you know, we're we're going to invoke the alliance between Australia and the US because it's been attacked. Uh, so there's this, um, I guess, more locked in uh, sort of feeling under John Howard. Then from 2007, there's um, the sort of Rudd Gillard. Um, Rudd governments, uh, which, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, expectations, I guess, of Kevin Rudd because he, you know, was a former diplomat. He spoke Chinese. He <laughs> knew a lot about uh, at least Chinese literature and politics. Uh, but things started to get a little bit difficult uh, there. Uh, and then especially as America starts to do its sort of pivot to Asia, there's growing, growing pressure on um, on on Australian leaders really to sort of lock in behind that. And uh, there really has been a bit of a push. Uh, and throughout that whole time, America has sort of kind of had a little bit of a worry that the the trade relationship with China will sort of turn uh, Australia as, you know, make them, you know, I guess dependent on Chinese trade the way Germany was dependent on <laughs> Russian gas. Um, but, uh, and I think that's just gradually increased over time. And then it's really from about 2015, 2016, when things started to get really, really um, a bit, sour and nasty i guess in the relationship between australia and china because mm. i mean there's uh there's the 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 that that old dynamic between australia and, and uh the united mm. states but there's a dispute over huawei there's a dispute over foreign influence there's uh, a, a range of trade disputes and then the sort of um sort of 2016 happens with brexit and Trump and everyone goes a bit crazy about America's role in the world, and then it gets it gets a little bit um, difficult. And it's really only in I guess the last year or so. I mean, literally, Australia's diplomats and ministers and prime minister were sort of frozen out from kind of diplomatic contact with China for I think it was like about five years. Uh, some pretty hostile rhetoric and there was a feeling from Australia's side that, you know, maybe China was going a little bit hard and being um, intimidating Australia, tr trying to influence us too much. Uh, and I guess China probably also felt, well, <laughs> you know, what are all these guns pointed at us? <laughs> yeah. I, I have to say, I read articles uh, in fact, not just articles, editorials in Chinese media, the Chinese media, a couple of years ago, especially, mm. where they were absolutely shocked mm. and very, very dismayed mm. about this turn in Australian policy towards them, against them. Mm. And this, by the way, predates AUKUS. I mean, I remember mm. reading articles like this. I mean, they hadn't expected, they'd mm. assumed that they had a good, steady, stable relationship with Australia. Mm. And the Chinese are, you know, they, they were astonished at how suddenly, from their perspective, it mm. changed. And mm. I think they were also very disappointed, as by the way the Russians have been, about Germany, mm. about the fact that all of these people in Australia, the business people, the business community there, which presumably has done very well from the trade with China, how um, quiet it has been, even as this great change has happened. It, has there been any pushback from the business community in, the, in, in Australia? I mean, you know. Oh, look, I mean, there has been to some degree. I mean, in a, in a funny sort of way, I feel that uh, like what we uh, have said in Australia for, I mean, I don't know, decades, it was certainly something that like John Howard said from 96 to 2007 or whatever was, 
you know, um, America is our security partner, China is our economic partner. Uh, we can live with both. We don't have to make a choice. Uh, but like people like John Mearsheimer used to come over here and say, well, you know, America's going to force you to make a choice, fellas. <laughs> He, uh, can I just say he's he's made that very same point to me as well. He's actually spoken yeah, about the fact yeah. that he came to Australia and he was telling the Australians, you know, you 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 think you can have your cake and eat it, but the Americans won't let you. Yeah, and uh, I mean, I, I I think, and you know, this is just my opinion, but I think we'd probably, and in a way, back in the seventies, this. And in the 90s, this was a little bit more of the case that it, it, China wasn't just in like our economic partner box. It was uh, we were looking to intensify diplomatic and political relationships. We were looking to intensify cultural relationships um, uh, and, you know, security relationships might be a bit far, but there was it was perhaps to one-dimensional a sort of diplomatic relationship and as a result it was fragile it was you know at risk i guess of those other forces coming by and like um like from the 70s there's been a huge huge push to you know promote uh, asian language study asian you know uh, area study type um Activities. Many people I, who I've known over my um, life have done uh, enormous work in that regard, but it 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 simply hasn't really taken off as much as you would like. Uh, so I just feel that uh, you know perhaps the lesson longer term is not just to have this idea that we have an economic partner and a, and a uh, security partner. We actually have to have these dimensions of the relationship with with all countries Has and, it never? yeah i mean yep. that it, that sort of goes to what some people you know some of the critics of AUKUS and current foreign, foreign policy direction are saying which is they you know we need to try to get some uh, people talk about concert of powers or some sort of uh, I guess you could say collective security arrangement in um, the West Pacific or Indo-Pacific Maritime Asia uh, that isn't solely reliant on US dominance but has buy-in from uh, all the powers of Maritime Asia, which include China and include Indonesia, who which is a... Um, you know, super, super important country to Australia. It's, you know, our nearest neighbour uh, and includes India, obviously, as well as all of Southeast Asia and even, you know, heresy of heresy, Russia, because Russia is a Pacific power after all. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, can I just say on, on, on the fact that Australia was at one time heavily involved in involving itself in developing Chinese studies and things like that. I mean, I, mm. I have actual personal knowledge of this because a friend of mine, Kerry Brown, is a sinologist, an mm. important British sinologist, and he actually, for a time, had a post in an Australian university, mm. a teaching post, by the way. And the point that he made to me many, many times is that the Australians were perfectly positioned to use both China and America to exert leverage against both. That mm. the, the, their, their particular skill, their great utility to both the Americans and the Chinese was that they were able to talk to each and understand each and work mm. with each. And that in a situation where US-Chinese relations were fracturing, it was not in Australia's interest to overcommit to one side or to the other. The best mm. thing for Australia to do was to act as a sort of communicator between both of them. Mm. I don't yeah. suppose this debate or dialogue ever happened in Australia, but I mean, it makes sense to me. 
Oh, look, uh, I agree. I think that's, uh, I think it did happen and a lot of people devoted their careers in, you know, uh, diplomatic and, you know, academic and uh, bureaucratic careers to, to um, that sort of objective, I think. To some degree, that was definitely the case, like with Bob Hawke and uh, Paul Keating, I think, to some degree. Uh, also kind of Malcolm Malcolm Fraser. But um, uh, um, I, I think in a way it, it just comes down to this long uh, intellectual habit or, or ingrained habit in uh, Australia of uh, for good reasons for believing that um, being the the uh, first mate of the most powerful country on the world in the world is our best strategy uh, so we'd rather be the kind of first mate of the number one power rather than I guess pursue a a a, a kind of a multilateral um, uh, strategy within a multipolar world, I think, and in in some ways, I, I would say that uh, like the way India has uh, used its advantages of diplomatic power uh, over the last decade, but especially over the last couple of years, uh, is perhaps a lesson to Australia that um, uh, you don't necessarily need to be the world's greatest <laughs> military power to uh um i think um uh dr s j shankar the indian external affairs minister talks about india not choosing sides but standing for, on its own ground and I, I think we really ought to do that in in australia and 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 this is also what some of the critics of AUKUS say it's 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 um locking our foreign policy very much into defence strategy rather than uh, uh, Australia being a diplomatic superpower. Well, well, I mean, you know, even with six to eight nuclear submarines, I mean, what are we really going to do to China? <laughs> um, whereas where we could be, um, you know, uh, we're in a really pretty secure position you know down there in the southern pacific southern indian ocean um china's got you know a lot of countries it needs to get past first before it gets to australia uh it's not really in china's interest to sort of shoot out its own iron ore and you know minerals and all the rest of it yeah. food um uh so why don't we find a way to sort of get along with with uh all the parts of the world and not just trying to be the, the loyalist uh, first mate to America. I've got two last questions and um, before I hand over to Alex, but the first is this, does it never occur to people in Australia that there are historical precedents for Australia that suggest that it might not be a particularly good idea to overcommit to one power however strong, which has lots of interests around the world. As a British person, I always remember the fact that in 1914 and 1939, the British king declared war for Australia. I mean, the Australians weren't even consulted. I mean, they were told by the British that they were at war with Germany and whatever. And, you know, maybe the Australians had interests in becoming involved in those wars but i mean it was a, not a decision ultimately made by them and america has its global commitments it's they might come and press australia and ask australians to do things which might not be either desirable for australians or in their interests that's the first thing the second and this is the big question that i think a lot of people want me to ask and i'm going to ask it mm. what about the what about julian assange because of course julian assange is right in the center of this whole issue because he's an australian citizen he's of course in in london where i am at the moment we've just had a hearing about that but many many of his supporters 
have been very disappointed about the fact that the government of his own country, Australia, hasn't spoken up for him as they feel it should have done. And is that also because he's been sacrificed, in effect, on the altar of this relationship that Australia seems to be determined to forge with the United States, or at least the Australian elite is? Um, so um, I'll do Assange second. But the, so the first question was, you know, uh, have we thought about the risks of being, um, you know, first mate to um an overcommitted power. Look, I think a lot of people have. Um, I, I've written a few articles uh, over the last year or so where I sort of compare America to um, the uh, the sort of Moby Dick, you know, the, the story of Moby Dick, the Captain Ahab wants revenge against the white whale and he sails, says Peckwood, with his revenge all, all around the world and ultimately sinks the ship. And I, I feel at times Australia is uh, caught on <laughs> the Peckwood um, subject to revenge. But a lot of people have thought about that. Uh, but I guess it goes back to that sense that, um, you know, there's a lot of people who have a very strong interest and there are there have been a lot of benefits to Australia uh, and Australia hasn't been like a vassal in its relationship with either Britain or uh, America. It's actually been, you know, a relatively powerful and influential uh, ally within, within, you know, uh, uh, a, a kind of a world system. Uh, so I think it's it's less the sort of general attitudes. It's the it's the sort of I guess the leadership circles, the key decision making circles, who are uh, institutionally surrounded by these relationships and these connections, etc. And it's sort of like it's the sort of air that they breathe is is the American alliance, and they can see many of, of the benefits. I mean, there was a great. Um, debate between John Mearsheimer and a guy called Peter Varghese, who was the former head of the Foreign Affairs Department, uh, which you can watch on YouTube. And it, probably because John Mearsheimer was involved, it's had like 350,000 views. Uh, I don't think that would have happened with uh, Peter Varghese. But um, uh, it, it goes to this question. I mean, Peter Varghese, who used to be the head of the Foreign Affairs um basically said American primacy is good for Australia, so we'd like it to continue. So the sort of assessment of the the risks and benefits is like that amongst amongst many. Uh, and then Julian Assange, um, you know, I don't know an awful lot around Julian Assange, uh, and I, I don't know whether he's been sacrificed, as you say. Um, certainly the earlier on in his political career, um, uh, the current Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, made comments supportive of release of Julian Assange. And there was a vote in the Australian Parliament just in the last couple of weeks, uh, kind of along those lines. But it just has a little bit of a feeling of... Um, uh, a, a, a limited gesture very late in the day that uh, will allow the government to say that it's uh, made efforts when when it really perhaps could have done so, like, I don't know, 10 years ago. <laughs> Jeff Rich, thank you very much for an incredibly informative program. I'm going to hand over to Alex. I think we are now getting some questions through and there may be some questions you might want to put to you. Cool. Yeah, we have a couple a couple of questions and comments and uh, we will uh, wrap the, the live stream up. And whatever other questions we have, Alexander, me and you can, can knock them out. But um, Danielle says, how about we get our sovereignty back in Australia and get Julian home? Yeah. And uh, Danielle also says, we had a great anti anti-war bands and songs that became our anthems, Midnight Oil, Red Gum, no Australian voices in our music now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, um, Peter Garrett, who was the lead singer of Midnight Oil, you might know him, he, he subsequently, you know, and 
uh, famously had this song, you know, US forces get the nod, not, you know, look out for your country sort of thing. Uh, it's an absolutely iconic song uh, in Australia in the, I don't know, late 1970s, early 1980s. And he subsequently became uh, a minister in the Kevin Rudd Labor government. And I think he might have made comments uh, critical of AUKUS. I'm not sure. But, yeah, he, he, he's perhaps symptomatic of this sort of uh, the that that spirit of the 1970s, that spirit of independence in the 1970s has been kind of closed down a lot over the last 30 years. Mm. And a question from Darwin is right. Um, Australia, UK, Canada, they were involved in the election 2020, the Biden-Trump election. They pushed the dossier. They also targeted the Trump campaign. And... Um, and I view the UK, Australia, and, and Canada as enemies of the US. What do you, I guess the question is, what uh, what are your thoughts about Australia's involvement in the the election, the 2020 election? Alexander uh, da Downer or da Downing? Right, that, that, uh, was, yeah. that was the 2016 election. Just to, well, that was the 2016, yeah, the 2016 yeah. election. Yeah, yeah, that was 2016. Yeah, yeah. Well, all of Which that. I what do you make of Australia? I think this it, is, it's all, yeah. yeah, all relative. Yeah. What do you make of, of, of Australia's connection to all this stuff from 2016 um, going all the way up to 2020? I don't know, Alex. Look, I've got a very small YouTube channel, so I don't know if I'm really <laughs> safe to say much on safe this. To say point. that, okay. But okay. Uh, Alexander Downer was the foreign affairs, uh, the foreign minister for Australia through the Howard government from '96, I think, to 2007. It's like, um, and I think he was then subsequently like the High Commissioner in London, so the Ambassador to London. Uh, and I think it was when he was there that he had this you know, odd meeting with George Papadopoulos that uh, played a role in Russia Gate. And um, I don't know if he's ever really commented or really been asked terribly much uh, within Australia about that. Um, so I don't know, maybe you should invite him onto the Duran one day. <laughs> Ask if, him. If, 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 if we can find these guys, we'll, we'll invite Professor Biff suit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Uh, Jeff, thank you very much for joining us on this live stream. I have uh, your, uh, yeah, Alexander. I, I was just going to say, we're going to have you again, definitely, Jeff, because we need to discuss Australian foreign policy many yes. times because it's going to become increasingly important. Thank you very much. Over back to Alex. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Uh, I have your I have your information, your YouTube channel, and your Substack in the description box down below, and I will add it as a pinned comment as well. Can I just add one yeah. quick? Uh, so yeah. I've just I think I've just put up on my YouTube channel a podcast I did. Back in 2021, actually a week or so after AUKUS was announced, it goes into a lot more mm -hmm. detail about the decision and foreign policy and the, mm. I guess, the history of foreign policy in Australia. So people might want to check that one out in particular. All right. Definitely check it out. Uh, check out Jeff's uh, YouTube channel. Check out Jeff's Substack. Jeff Rich, thank you very much for joining us. Take thank care. you. All right, Alexander. Let's uh, let's go through some of the remaining uh, questions, and we'll wrap up this this live stream. Uh, Robert, thank you for that super sticker. Nick, thank you for that super sticker. Christian, thank you for that super sticker. Um, let's see here. Nico says I replayed the OG MW3, and when Makarov was talking about how Russia will take over all of Europe, I realized. Uh, Vladimir Makarov is based on Vladimir Putin. The entire war, war is Newland's fantasy. They treat war as a video game. Right. I have to say, I, I, this, I, I, I'm not familiar with this. It, it looks as if you're talking about some fictional character in some novel or film or something or, or video game, uh, which I, I, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with. But yes, an awful lot of fiction is getting mixed up with facts. I've made this point many times myself. People have a mythological view of the other side, of the Russians especially. And um, this distorts our understanding of facts. 
and at their policies. I think that is absolutely correct. I'm not going to pretend I know uh, specifically what you're referring to. The, you know, the 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 um, obvious the, the, the work of fiction that you're referring to there. Yeah. Sparky says free Assange. Sparky mm -hmm. says go Yemen fight the power. Sparky says do not fight Israel. Sparky says build a better world for bricks. Mm -hmm. Four or five super chats in a row from Sparky. Um, <laughs> let's see. Sparky also says, uh, is he kidding? Australia has been a total vassal of the globalists, especially American ones. You know, this is not actually always true. I mean, there have been, uh, uh, as a British person, you know, we're, we're fairly close to Australia here. And it has always had a sort of radical edge, even in you know, the sort of late period of the British Empire, late 19th, early 20th century. There are always people in Australia who are kicking back in some kind of ways because you you know you need to know about the history of how Australia was built up by the British, the kind of people who went there. So it's never been an entirely easy vassal. But I suspect, going back to some of the things that Jeff Rich was talking about, it makes the it makes the elite in Australia even more determined to attach themselves first to Britain and then to the United States because they sense, they see some part of Australia always, as they would say, wanting to take a walk on the wild side. It's not quite as conformist a society as many people imagine. Yeah, Lou Reed, take a walk on the wild side. Robert, uh, thank, you. <laughs> thank you for uh, that uh that membership to the drag community. Elsa says, thank you, gentlemen. And Jungle Jin says, hard to see Australia as anything but a vassal. We've been involved in every US military adventure, most of which had nothing to do uh, with Oz as a nation. Indeed. And I mean, that is the risk that Australia runs. I mean, I said about how Australia was committed to two world wars by, by the British king. I, I suspect that in both cases, especially the second one, they would have decided anyway if it had been put to them that they wanted to be a part of it because of the issues involved. But the fact is, the, the king just went ahead and just issued, uh, you know, declarations of war. And the British just assumed that the Australia Australians would loyally follow. And sure enough, they did. <laughs> it does seem astonishing, given that by this point, Australia was already to a great extent uh, you know, an independent state with, you know, its own government, its own parliament, its own laws, its own uh, public opinion. You would have thought that there would be at least some murmurs of, you know, concern and reflection from the Australian people about the way in which they were committed. Especially, you know, after, you know, disasters like Gallipoli and that kind of thing. Yeah, Jungle Jane also says no one is kicking back in Oz, not against the U.S. No. All right, thank you, Jungle Jane. All right, uh, that is uh, Sparky says I agree with Alexander as for historical Australia goes, but not of late. Yeah. Thank you for that, Sparky. Uh, that is that is everything, Alexander. Um, I'm just going to ask you one quick question, mm -hmm. and then we're going to sign off. And it has to do with Macron yeah, and his statements. Yeah, Alexander, what do you make of Macron's statements about NATO troops or, or EU troops possibly entering uh, into the conflict in Ukraine? Your thoughts? Uh, well, I think it is, first of all, a symptom of panic. I mean, they, they can see the way in which the situation in Ukraine is now accelerating out of their control. So it's panic. but. People who are in panic, and you know, he called this urgent meeting to the Elysee Palace, brought people from uh, you know all 20 countries to come along and attend. Um, people who are panicking do incredibly reckless and dangerous things. And I have to say, I'm not at all surprised that it is Macron who's advocating this. And it may happen. I mean, you know, there's a lot of talk about this now. You remember we were talking a few uh, days ago about this talk about setting up this iron triangle of uh, fortified cities on the Dnieper River to try to hold the Russians back. We've had all this rhetoric now for several weeks about, you know, the fact that the Russians are coming and we've got to stop them on the Dnieper or somewhere else. So I, I could just 
quite easily see the political leaders in France, Germany, the EU, of course, enthusiastically embracing this, wanting to send troops into Ukraine. Now, various governments, Sweden, uh, for example, I believe Germany as well, have said that they're not going to do this. But and Macron, the Polish foreign minister, and I think Polish also foreign said, minister, yeah. Radek Sikorski. And, you know, Poland's already, they've already got, you know, massive protests on the borders with uh, um, Ukraine, farmers protesting. It isn't just apparently farmers. People of Poland, right across Poland, are becoming angry. And, you know, they're flying uh, Soviet flags and fitting up pictures of Putin, which you know anything about Poland. You would know how extraordinary that is. So, I mean, I can understand why the Poles are not, you know, well, rushing to welcome this. But, you know, I can't help but think that Macron, in his panic, is talking for a very strong sentiment, very strongly felt in Brussels and within some factions within the German government as well. And they might do it. I mean, it's the sort of crazy thing that these people could do. It would be the most dangerous thing one can possibly imagine they are they think again perhaps that you know the russians are bluffing and you know simply sending troops into ukraine the russians will simply back off the russians have been launching missile strikes searching for french mercenaries who they already say are nato soldiers and have been killing them so, I mean, you know, it, it, the Russians are not bluffing. And I can easily see how the situation could completely escalate out of control and could become unbelievably dangerous. Um, Macron, we were looking at, to him before the war started to impart some sense. I think with this, this affair, we can see what a dangerous man he actually is. Yeah, Russia has has been preparing for this. They don't want this to happen, but they have been preparing for this. They have hundreds of thousands of troops just waiting in reserve in case mm -hmm. NATO does uh, do something. And um, and definitely the EU is is panicking. I think this goes back to uh, the, the video that I'll have up today where we discuss uh, Tom Lungo's article that goes back to, to the preservation of Europe yeah. and trying to keep Europe uh, afloat and it goes back to the war bonds and the euro bonds and, and i think that's yeah. that's why you see the europeans uh, really panicking at the the collapse of project ukraine absolutely i mean i think the other thing just to say is that of course uh, any idea of sending a, a european expeditionary force without the united states is absolutely crazy and if you know anything at all about sentiment in the United States at the moment, you know there will be enormous opposition in the United States to the United States sending troops to Ukraine. Um, there will be enormous opposition in Europe. But the European military is in no condition to take on the Russians. Everybody knows this. But panic, anger, fear, they're all a dangerous cocktail. And one sense is that it's this, these are the, how the decisions are being made at the moment. I just want to add one last point, which is, of course, that for Macron to be panicking in this way, and, you know, he called this meeting in such a rush, that suggests that they're getting information from Ukraine, which suggests that the situation there is even worse than even we who follow the war day by day, hour by hour, uh, uh, know about. So just 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 think of that too. Yeah, just a final comment, and we'll sign sign off, Alexander. I, I just get the sense that things are moving very fast now. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying this is going to wrap up in, in in a week or in a month, but it does it does feel like uh, things are accelerating, and and I kind of have this sense of a you know when I listen to to, to Zelensky and, and all the people around him, I do have this type of Baghdad Bob. Yeah. type of rhetoric sense that's that's coming out of them where, where, where they're talking up a big game but they're, they're done for i mean that i, I don't know if do you have the same type, oh, of, yeah, absolutely. type absolutely. of feeling about what's what's happening absolutely. and i'm and i'm not saying this is going to end no. in a week or in a month no. but you can feel that something is happening no 
I mean, I absolutely hate this uh, par- you know, this uh, 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 metaphor that people use about the Russian steamroller <laughs> going all the way back to the First World War, by the way. But that is what we're now starting to see in Ukraine. The Russians are just driving forward. And of course, they didn't expect this. The, the Western powers, or at least the Europeans, didn't imagine that this could possibly happen. And they're freaking out. They're absolutely panicking. And they're sensing that the Americans might not be there for them and might not be able to come to their rescue. <laughs> and um, They're seeing all their great plans and strategies and ideas turning to dust. And you're right, the pace of events is accelerating. When each of us publish our videos today, we will be providing more details of that. But you can see this literally. The the situation now is changing by the hour. And, you know, a Baghdad Bob, 31,000 dead Ukrainians. I mean, really? I mean, if that is not if that is not an example of that, what 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 is Uh, one one final question about the UK? Uh, Lord Cameron, uh, Lord Cameron, he was at the meeting with Macron. Is the UK in any position to to send troops to to Ukraine or West Ukraine or anything like that? Well, he, he can send troops, but he can't send many troops, and he can't send many tanks. And um, the the one part of the British military that still has some viability is the British Air Force, but apparently even that is not in a particularly good way. Apparently, only half the planes work, and there aren't even enough pilots to fly those so you know i mean that there, there are problems in you know, all of those so, i mean there are problems we can send troops but i mean you know not enough not by any means enough and why would we want to i mean it would be an absolute disaster for us and i have to say i think that again if the british public which has been quiescent about this issue because The entire media is united in support of it. But if the British public was suddenly confronted with a decision to send troops to Ukraine, I think you start to see, for you know, the unease that now exists and which has been spreading for a long time. Oh, you don't see Ukrainian flags in front of houses as you used to, you know, uh, you know, a year ago. I mean, they've all disappeared. You'd see all that nervousness and doubt and worry and fear it would finally burst out into the open and of course if george galloway is elected to parliament on thursday then you will have a powerful anti-war voice anti-ukraine war choice voice for the first time in the house of commons yeah all right and always keep in mind this is macron he can say one thing today and say something else tomorrow yeah that's very much his style Yes. And of course, the other thing, though, is that Fico, the Slovak leader, called him out. It, what do you mean? I mean, he what? he 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 disclosed ah, that yeah. this is Macron's thinking yeah. even yeah. before Macron yeah. uh, actually went ahead and said it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because Fito said he's not going to have any any part of, I mean, of any type of intervention, incursion into Ukraine. Obviously, Orban is not going to have any part of it. Hungary's not going to have any part of it. So you already mentioned Poland. It's got all these issues uh, with the, with the border and the farmers. Um, I don't know if you saw the images at the EU headquarters the the other day with the farmers. I mean, absolutely. I mean, this could break, if they do this, it will break the EU. That's my own personal view. I mean, you know, assuming we get through it without world war three breaking out, then the the most likely outcome of it will, will be that it will break the EU. If, yeah. if the EU starts committing European troops to fight in Ukraine, then, as I said, it's the one thing that would galvanise the entire European public against it. And if it ends in disaster, well, um, I can't see how the EU could get out of it. Yeah, but roughly. panicky, frightened, angry people, they do all sorts of crazy things. And I agree, you know, Macron says one thing one day, it's something completely different the next. Uh, Raphael Ligonde says, German Chancellor has just said no, no, NATO in Ukraine. I've just seen that. But and I'm sure there'll be a lot of opposition. But, you know, we can't assume this isn't going to happen. Unfortunately, on this issue, they've been on the escalatory escalator 
all the time. And this is the obvious last point of it. Yeah. One final uh, comment, question. Baerbach didn't expect the sanctions to work. Macron probably doesn't expect the military to win either, but Europe could do it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the, the Biden administration is now telling us they do not want to cripple the Russian economy because it's too systemic for the world economy. You're kidding me? No, I mean, you know, the, they really didn't believe that it would. I mean, we mustn't take all of this seriously. I think, as I said, they're panicking, and this is a sign of panic yeah. and a sign of how bad the situation on the ground actually is. But it's very dangerous. Merely raising these ideas is very dangerous. And let's hope that calmer, saner heads step in and stop this uh, uh, taking us where it seems to be going. Yeah, it could also be Macron uh, threatening the United States. In, well, in Macron's obviously. own way, you know, either yeah. either you give us a 61 billion or we're going to go in. So he well, may be so. trying to thread into the uh, well, uh, the house in, in Mike Johnson, which Mike Johnson will have to call his bluff. Well, absolutely. Well, I mean, that's the kind of absurd, overcomplicated thinking that Macron likes. So I mean, it's entirely yeah. possible. But I mean, you know, if, if he thinks that he can intimidate people like Mike Johnson. I mean, that he's an absolute fool. But then Macron is exactly that. He's a very clever <laughs> man who deep down is really a fool. I mean, yeah. that's that's been the consistent reality of Macron uh, uh, yeah. throughout his presidency. Jupiter. Little Jupiter. Napoleon. All right. Uh, I, believe, I believe his popularity is down about 17%. I may be, he's, I may be. he's running away from farmers. I mean, yeah, no, you know. absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. Any any final thoughts, Alexander? And we'll sign off for today. No, I mean, you know, just to go back to what Jeff Rich was saying. I mean, the parallels between Germany and uh, Australia are striking. And again, you see the, the 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 nervousness of some people in these countries that they want to show their loyalty to America and to not to, to not really to America. Let's put that aside to the entire collective west project because they don't have that rootedness in their own countries to understand the you know to see things in terms of their own country's interests and that's the that's why we're getting all these crazy decisions that are being made the one place i want to say this again where you actually get intelligent debate about ukraine is the United States. You actually get articles there of a kind that you will never see published in any European country actually strongly disagreeing and uh, challenging the policy. All right. Thank you, Tim, for that. All right. We are going to sign off. Take care, everybody. Thank you to our moderators, by the way. Thank you to all our moderators. And thank you to everyone that uh, tuned in for this live stream. Take care.